In this video, we're going to take a look at ripple filters. And in particular, I'd like to take a look at the following example circuit. This is an example of a DC power supply. And what we're going to do in this video is answer the following question. How big should the capacitor be to achieve a particular ripple? If you watch my last video on building a DC power supply, I described an approximate method. In this video, we're going to get more precise. Let's build a mathematical model for this circuit. First of all, let's assume that the transformer and the diodes are ideal. What effect would the capacitor have on the ripple at the output? In a sense, our capacitor and resistor represent the load. What does it mean for a transformer to be ideal? Well, it means that the voltage here is going to be maintained at 12 volts irrespective of the load. Therefore, I can represent that transformer by a perfect voltage source. In this case, it's a perfect 12 volt RMS sinusoidal source. Now, what do the diodes do if they're ideal? Well, since this is a full bridge rectifier, the diodes simply convert any negative voltage into a positive voltage. Therefore, they simply modify the source. Now we're left with the following question. What happens if that capacitor is in the circuit or if it's not in the circuit? To answer that, let's look at a slightly simpler situation. Let's say that I have a resistor hooked up directly to a 12 volt DC source. And I ask you, what is the voltage across the resistor? Well, it's obviously 12 volts. Let me now add a capacitor to this circuit. I'll ask the same question. What's the voltage across the resistor? Well, it's still 12 volts. And it's 12 volts irrespective of what capacitor I choose because that source is ideal. If the capacitor is two microfarads or it's two megafarads, because it's a perfect source, the voltage is still going to be 12 volts. Therefore, the capacitor has absolutely no effect on this particular circuit. What if I were to replace that DC source with an AC source? Would it make any difference? No, it's the same answer. The capacitor doesn't have any effect at all. Now let's go back to our mathematical model of our power supply here. What effect does the capacitor have on our output? Well, if the transformer and the diodes are ideal, the capacitor will have absolutely no effect whatsoever on the output voltage. A capacitor in this situation cannot improve the ripple. On the other hand, when we actually built this circuit in the previous video, we noticed that the capacitor did indeed help the ripple. The problem here is with our model. We need a better model. The transformer is obviously not ideal. The diodes are also not ideal. Let's start with the diodes and compare an ideal diode to a non-ideal diode. An ideal diode switches either on or off. If the voltage is positive, then current passes through the diode, otherwise it's blocked. Let's look at a semi-ideal diode. Let's assume that it has a turn-on voltage or a threshold voltage. Normally, if it's a silicon diode, then that threshold voltage will be about 0.7 volts. If the voltage is higher than the threshold voltage, then current will flow through the diode. Anything less than that, the current will be blocked. A more realistic model of a diode is now shown. If the voltage is greater than the threshold, then the diode has some built-in resistance as indicated by the slope of the line here. Otherwise, current is blocked if the voltage is below the threshold. Let's now take a look at the transformer. An ideal transformer will maintain the same output voltage irrespective of the current passing through the load. Of course, that's not what happens with normal transformers. If you've watched my video on non-ideal transformers, you might recall that we can model the output side of a transformer as having a series resistance there with the load. This causes the voltage to start to fall as more and more current is drawn through the secondary side of the transformer. Since both the transformer and the diode effectively have built-in series resistances, we can now improve our model a little bit. I'm lumping them together here. By the way, R sub D is not exactly the resistance of one particular diode, because at any particular moment, two of the diodes are actually going to be turned on here. This is the model that we're going to be using. In the previous video, I actually built this circuit, so this is the transformer that we used. Let's take a look at the data sheet and see if we can come up with a more realistic model for this particular transformer. In particular, I'm interested in the R sub T, that series resistance at the secondary side. In order to model that R sub T, I'm interested in how the voltage at the output side varies with the current at the output side or the secondary side of the transformer. Let's see if we can come up with some numbers here by looking at the data sheet alone. First of all, we can find the no load voltage. 
The data sheet tells us there's a correction factor of 1.39. Our no load voltage is thus 16.68 volts. The power indicated here is basically the maximum load. This will give us another point on the graph. We know that current is power divided by voltage and the voltage at maximum load is 12 volts. Therefore, we can find the current. It's 0.125 amperes and this corresponds to 12 volts. Therefore, we have another point on our graph. Our transformer series resistance will be the slope of that line. This works out to 37.4 ohms. In the last video, I put together this circuit without the capacitor in parallel with the load. In the oscilloscope, we obtained a voltage versus time plot that looked like this. Three different data points were measured in the course of that video. They're shown on the graph. If we plot a trend line, we can read the resistance from the slope of the line. This includes the effect of both the transformer and the diodes. Together, of course, the resistance is higher than that of the transformer alone. This is what we're going to use in our model, 76.7 ohms. I would now like to work out a detailed example. Plot the output waveform with various choices of the ripple capacitor. It's this non-ideality in our transformer and diodes that allows the ripple capacitor to function as a filter in this particular circuit. We're going to be assuming a load resistance of 152 ohms and a peak voltage of 24 volts showing up at the output if the capacitor is not there at all. This is what our model looks like. And here at the input side, we effectively have a rectified signal. This is what it would look like if the diodes didn't have any turn on voltage at all. But we know that they have a 0.7 volt turn on voltage. Therefore, it's flat at the bottom a little bit. This peak is 24 volts. This is not really an easy problem to solve because this is an example of a nonlinear source. The way to handle it is to linearize it. We're going to use the same strategy that we've used in some of our previous videos. We're going to convert this nonlinear source into a sum of sine waves and then use superposition in order to find the output voltage. The first thing we need to do is express this odd looking signal as a sum of sine waves. We need to use a Fourier series in order to do that. First, we identify the period. It's one divided by two times our line frequency, which here in Singapore is 50 hertz. That gives us a period of 0.01 seconds. In order to find the components of our Fourier series, or the coefficients here, we apply the following formula. It's not easy to take these integrals. In general, there's no analytic solution. However, we can find the numerical solution by using Mathematica. That's how I've done it. For example, this is what the Mathematica code looks like if you wanted to calculate A sub 2. To summarize, over here on the left, we have a plot of V sub t. That can be expressed as an infinite series. We have a formula for calculating A sub n. Therefore, it should be possible in order to express this as a sum of cosines in this situation. I've chosen cosine because it's an even function rather than an odd function. The sum here goes to infinity, but we can truncate it to just a few terms. Let's take a look at how the signal gets better and better the more terms we add to the series. Here's what it looks like with just one term. This gives us the DC average. Here's what it looks like with two terms, three terms, five terms, and 26 terms. I think that this particular expression for the voltage very closely resembles the voltage of our non-sinusoidal expression that we started with. Let's go with this one. To summarize, we now have an expression for the voltage. We'll truncate our Fourier series at 26 terms. We have a complete description of the input voltage, in other words. Let's now proceed to the problem. We're going to plot the output waveform with various capacitor choices. How are we going to do that? Well, we already have an expression for our input voltage. We're going to be using superposition in order to find the voltage at the output. Since our voltage can be expressed as a sum of cosines, we can solve the circuit separately for each one of them. We can then use superposition to find the voltage across the load. Let's draw the circuit for just one of these voltage sources in the series here. Let's now convert this circuit into phasor form. If we look up here at our expression for V sub n, we see that each component has an amplitude of A n and a phase of zero degrees. Therefore, we can just write A n angle zero for that source. 
our impedance is 1 divided by j omega c. Omega, of course, changes with n. Let's say that our output voltage has magnitude b sub n and phase offset phi sub n. In other words, this will be the time domain expression for our output voltage. We can use voltage division to actually find the expression of this output voltage per source. We can drop the phase angle of zero and expand out our components that are in parallel. Finally, we have an expression for the output voltage in terms of the input voltage and all of our components of the circuit. Let's now summarize what we've done. We started with a complicated input voltage, something that's not sinusoidal, but we've taken that input voltage and we've expressed it as a sum of 26 sine waves by using the Fourier series. We have an output in terms of our input in phase or form. We know all of the B in, we know all of the phi in through this expression. Therefore, we have an expression for the output voltage as a function of time. I've used the computer program Mathematica in order to make the following plots. Let's see how the output waveform now looks as I change the capacitor. Let's start with no capacitor at all, or zero microfarads. Without a capacitor, we simply have a voltage divider. Our output voltage here in blue is just a reduced version of our input voltage. Here's what it looks like if we add a 25 microfarad capacitor in parallel with our load resistor. 50 microfarads, 100 microfarads, 470 microfarads. You can see that our ripple is improving. That's what we expect the larger the capacitor becomes. 1,000 microfarad, we're almost at a 5% ripple now. 2.2 millifarads, and finally 3.3 millifarads. The solution here tells us that a ripple is less than 2%. I've actually carried out these calculations for a large number of capacitors so that we can see exactly how the ripple changes as a function of the capacitor. On the left here, we have ripple expressed as a ratio. So when there's no capacitor at all, the ripple is 100%. As the capacitor gets larger and larger, the ripple starts to fall and approaches zero with very large capacitors. We can also express the ripple as just a voltage difference, maximum voltage minus minimum voltage, and we see the same effect over here. If you watched my previous video, you might recall that I gave a rather simple expression that you can use to estimate what the ripple would be. I here is the maximum current that you would expect to flow in the circuit, F is the line frequency, and then C is the capacitor that you're choosing. As you can see, this particular expression, if used correctly, overestimates the ripple compared to the more exact method that we've used here in this video in order to calculate the ripple. The last thing that I'd like to take a look at here before wrapping up the video is to see how the ripple changes with the load. As you can imagine, if you use a very large load resistor, then it won't draw very much current from your circuit and a capacitor doesn't have very much trouble maintaining the low ripple voltage that you would like from any DC power supply. However, as the load resistor gets smaller and smaller, or in other words, it starts to draw more and more current from your power supply, then the ripple is going to get worse and worse. What I hope that you've learned from this video is that by using things like phasers, by using things like Fourier analysis, you can, in fact, calculate very exact expressions for things like ripple voltage. I hope that you've come to understand how power supplies can be designed from first principles. This video is part of an organized sequence where I explore various AC and switching circuits. If you enjoyed it, then you might consider following the channel's playlist to learn more about these types of circuits.